আমাকে শোনা যাচ্ছে ক্লিয়ার মঞ্জুর হ্যাঁ তোমাকে শোনা যাচ্ছে বেশ ভালোই আচ্ছা তাহলে আমি মনে হয় আমরা শুরু করে দিতে পারি জাস্ট ছয়টাই তো সাকিব কি বলি সাকিব ক্যামেরা ঠিক একটু তোমার আমি এই যে এই যে দাঁড়ায় কথা বলছি হ্যাঁ 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 দ্যাটস গুড ওকে গুড ওকে ওকে করব শুরু করব ছয়টা বেজে গেছে আমি শুরু করতেছি থ্যাংক ইউ ফর ইওর অ্যাটেনশন লেডিজ এন্ড জেন্টলম্যান I am Nazmul Hassan, host of this session. Currently, I'm working as principal track expert with SNC Lawalin in Vancouver, Canada. Our vice chairman, Mr. Saifu Jaman, is eagerly waiting to welcome you. Mr. Saifu Jaman, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, my name is Mohamed Saifu Jaman. Uh, I'm acting as a vice chairman uh, or secretary of this uh, big BC. Uh, honorable guest speaker dr najm sadat distinguished guest and valued member of big bc assalamu alaikum happy 50th anniversary day of bangladesh on behalf of bangladesh engineers and computer science special, uh, professionals of british columbia it is my great pleasure to welcome you uh, at this event our today's event is divided in uh, two part first part is uh, Uh, our um, guest speaker will present a very attractive presentation on leadership and emo emotional intelligence uh, and the second part will be cultural program based on our uh, 50th anniversary of our independence day uh, so far uh, we have seen around 35 members uh, join this zoom but we are expecting more people uh, shortly we appreciate your time uh, and we want to thank all of you to participate this beautiful event a special thanks to those joining from bangladesh uh, by cutting their uh, comfortable morning sleep now i'm handing over microphone to uh, our um, beloved mr najmul hasan to host this event thank you so much thank you saifu jawan i would like to call shahid anwar to speak on our house rule Sahid Anwar. Assalamu alaikum. Um, there are some house rules um, um, for the Zoom meeting or any other meeting. Um, we have like a few. Number one is everybody will be on mute except the speaker. Uh, number two is raise your hand when you have questions to ask or you want to share your experience or you can type the questions uh, to be asked to a specific person on the chat box. Uh, number three, uh, we are a non-political organization, so we cannot share any political experience on stories um, in this meeting. Um, number five is be respectful to the presenter and the audience. Um, so uh, so this, these are all the house rules that we have to follow. And now back to Nazmul Bhai. Thanks. Thank you, Shahid. I believe we have a diverse audience today in terms of profession, age, education, gender, and spatial distribution. Just, I just wonder, I can call at random some people to explore this diversity. I see a name in our audience list, Reja Nambar. Reja Nambar, would you please tell about your location, national origin, profession and education in short. Reja Nambar. Reja Nambar, probably from Iran. Yes, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, carry on Reja. Yes, yes this is Reza Nambar. Uh, I'm in California uh, from Iran and I'm a colleague of Saqib Najmas, and I'm uh, very glad to participate in this and benefit from Saqib's speech this afternoon. Thank you, Raja. And I see another person, Dr. Nassim Saidi. Dr. Nassim Saidi. Dr. Nassim Saidi, please unmute your phone and speak. Sorry, uh, my name is Nassim Saidi. I'm joining from Ottawa, Canada. Thank you, Saidi. 
I see your name, Kashfia Billah. Kashfia Billah. Assalamu alaikum. I'm uh, Kashfia Billah, New Jersey, Princeton, New Jersey. Thank you, join Kuchi. Uh, Sakib is a very good friend of mine from back of the Buid days when we were uh, in college and uh, we were actually lab partners around that time. So I'm joining in from Princeton, New Jersey. I'm glad to be participating and listening to Sakib. Thank you, Kashfia. Mohammed Atiku Jaman. Hello, my name is Mohammed Atiku Zaman. I am from Oklahoma City in the US and I'm a professor here at the University of Oklahoma. I graduated from Boet uh, in the same year as Sakib. So he's a good friend of mine and uh, I look forward to what he has to say about leadership and entrepreneurship. And I'm from Bangladesh, just like Sakib and uh, others, some of, the, some of the people here. Thank you, Atik. Uh, Mohammed Amin. Mohammed Amin. I think Mohammed Amin. Mohammed Amin, can you hear me? Okay, let me go to another person. Samiha Tabassum. Please, Samiha Tabassum. Assalamu alaikum. This is Samiha from Bogura, Bangladesh. My mother's friend, Daisy Saki, messaged me yesterday to join this meeting. I'm really glad to join with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Sylvia Jalal. Please, Sylvia Jalal. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm joining from Ottawa, Canada. I work for the federal government. I'm a senior policy analyst, and it is my absolute pleasure to join today to listen to Saki Bhai um, and uh, to, to get informed. Thank you. Thank you. Tarana Jahan. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm joining from Vancouver. BC Canada. Um, I'm a co-host of this meeting and I would love to help if anybody has any uh, technical issue or anything. Thank you. So uh, we see we have a diverse audience. So I believe it will be a very interesting lecture with a diverse audience for Saki. Now I now I would like to introduce our persons who are here, uh, speakers and others. There's, so one day some people came to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I said, talk about you, Lord, from what object did he originate? The Prophet did not reply. Almighty Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala replied in only four verses in Surah Ikhlas. So I am trying to introduce our speaker, panelist, packs and moderator of this session very briefly. Nazmu Sakib. Nazmus Saqib is our distinguished guest speaker. He is a consulting engineer, entrepreneur, author, and above all, an excellent presenter. He is a multi-talented person with interest in different areas like literature, music, management, philosophy, religion, chess, and whatnot. To me, he is like a garlic. Exception is that each Love has different taste. He is my garlic friend. <laughs> Second, our panel consists of three members. They are Dr. Rehnuma Karim. Dr. Rehnuma Karim. Can I have a spotlight, Dr. Rehnuma Karim? Who can hold Dr. Rehnuma Karim as an employee? Probably none. She quitted her professorship from a State University of New York and started nonprofit Heroes for All, 
to enhance potential among young people in New York and Bangladesh. She is a competent trainer on leadership, on leadership, emotional intelligence, mindset, habit building, etc. Currently, she is working with a book on leadership with author and motivational speaker coach Jim Johnson. Manjur Choudhury. Manjur Choudhury is a very popular face on our Big PC platform. He is a utility GIS expert. He is a certified competent Toastmaster and leader from Toastmaster <laughs> International. He is passionate in promoting diversity and inclusion. To me, he is a person who is grown organically. We are all organic body. I mean, he is grown organically means he gathers everything from his experience, observation, very minute observation, and that's why he is a rich inherently by himself. Our next expert and moderator is Abdul Kayum Khan. Khan is moderator of this today's session. session. Currently, he is working as a supervising engineer at California Department of Water Resources. Dr. Khan had led many innovative projects in USA. He is passionate about unleashing leadership potential in everyone he meets. I am unfortunate that I could not meet him before. Maybe I would have been a great leader if I could have been in touch with him five years back or 10 years back even. Thank you, Khan. We are lucky to have a distinguished speaker and an outstanding panel. I believe after this lecture, all of you will think that I have saved 500 bucks. So if you transfer me 100 bucks, still you can save 400. Oh no, just I'm kidding. With this introduction, I would like to turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Kayum Khan. Dr. Khan. Thank you, Najmul. And I'll just start with, it is never too late to be a leader. Uh, so it is my singular pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Najmul Sakib to share his journey and insight on leadership and emotional intelligence. Please. After Sakib's presentation, uh, we'll have a brief uh, panel discussion on the topic, as Najmul stated. So uh, I would ask you, as you listen to Sakib, if you have any questions, please ask those uh, via the chat function. Uh, we'll try to get to those questions uh, during the panel discussion. Now, Sakib. Take it away. Thank you, Abdul. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So first of all, I want to thank all of you who have joined me today. It's amazing to see all of you in Zoom. I want to take this opportunity to thank Bangladeshi engineers and computer science professionals of British Columbia for inviting me to their monthly meeting. I know that all of you are success-driven people. My goal today is to set you on fire. Where did I get this idea from? I got this idea from a Canadian professional hockey player, Reggie Lich, who said, success is not the result of spontaneous combustion. You must first set yourself on fire. So leadership has a lot of similarity to a game. You cannot be successful at it or become good at it by reading about it or by taking few classes in leadership. You need to play. There is, you need to experience leadership. So let's start with the idea that leadership is a lived experience. So today I'll be sharing with you my personal journey of leadership. I'm lucky that I have had the good fortune of being in leadership role from my childhood through college and university and adult life. I have been involved in national level and local level organizations. I have been involved in student union. And also during my professional life, I was lucky enough to start a company, grow it, run it, and sell it to a larger company. So today I'm gonna to serve you a cocktail of my life learning, mixing and matching my own ideas with 
latest research on leadership. First, let us start with where we all stand today. We are all drowning in data, but starving for wisdom. So a few days ago, I did a Google search on leadership. And what I found, I found 2.8 billion results in 0.73 seconds. So you can imagine the information overload here. Then I did a search in Amazon for leadership books. And it showed up with 60,000. It showed up with 60,000 books on there. So you can see the drowning is actually real. So what I came up with is my own definition of leadership that you cannot find in Google. Leadership is doing things differently for purpose that is bigger than yourself. Pay attention to these two keywords, doing things differently and a purpose that is bigger than yourself. I'll explain to those in, during my presentation. Now, first, what I want to do, I want to share with you a movie clip from Hidden Figures, a 2016 movie. It's a movie about three black women who worked at NASA in the 1960s. At that time, blacks were not allowed to use white people's restroom. As a result, this black woman had to walk half a mile to go to a colored person's bathroom. As you watch the clip, please pay attention to the words and note how emotions play out and how the project leader, the boss, reacts to the new information. How the boss acts in a very different way to meet a higher purpose, to send an American to the space, a purpose higher than himself. So leadership is not a hidden talent. It's visible in your action. This is a three minute movie clip. Where the hell have you been? Everywhere I look, you're not where I need you to be. It's not my imagination. Now, where the hell do you go every day? To the bathroom, sir. To the bathroom. To the damn bathroom. For 40 minutes a day? What are you doing there? We're T minus zero here. I put a lot of faith in you. There's no bathroom for me here. What do you mean there's no bathroom for you there here? There is no bathroom. There are no colored bathrooms in this building or any building outside the West Campus, which is half a mile away. Did you know that? I have to walk to Timbuktu just to relieve myself. And I can't use one of the handy bikes. Picture that, Mr. Harrison. My uniform, skirt below my knees, my heels, and a simple string of pearls. Well, I don't own pearls. Lord knows you don't pay colors enough to afford pearls. And I work like a dog, day and night, living off a of coffee from a pot none of you want to touch. Excuse me, if I have to go to the restroom a few times a day. There we have it. No more color restrooms. No more white. Just plain old toilets. Go wherever you damn well please. Preferably closer to your desk. Yeah, that's what I guess. So you can see the leadership in action. 
I'm hearing some sounds from some sources. Could you please mute your microphones so that other people could hear these uh, videos that I'm going to show you? Any case, so why do you want to become a leader? Why does anyone want to become a leader? Here are some of the wrong reasons. If you want to become a leader for money, power, or prestige, then forget it. You'll never become a leader because greed for money, power, and prestige will cloud your judgment and you will miss the opportunity to show leadership because those reasons are not bigger than yourself. Now look at these right reasons, help others grow, passion for revision and responsibility. These reasons cannot cloud your judgment because they are bigger than yourself. So why put all these efforts to help others grow? What does it matter in the big scheme of universe? Probably nothing, sounds depressing, but we human beings are all seeking happiness to make our lives more joyful, aren't we? And leadership can help you. Leadership, like love, like music, has the power to make men and women happy by giving meaning to their lives. So leadership is an opportunity that is everywhere and nowhere. It depends on your mindset. Leadership applies only to work. That mindset is a wrong mindset. You need the next promotion to be a leader. That's also wrong. Leadership opportunities are available all around you. Families, sports, social clubs, nonprofits, at all levels of work, minimum wage to maximum wage. You just need to find it. But first, we need to change our mindset. Leadership is not a position, it is a role. People act according to their beliefs. Beliefs drives their values, values drives their attitudes and behavior. Unfortunately, most leadership books and training are focused on attitudes and behavior modification. That's why we end up with a two-legged stool. One leg of the stool is missing. So how do you change your mindset? Here's a word of wisdom from Socrates, a custom inspection in my back wall. Here's a picture of my friends from 1982 Buet class visiting me during the union a couple of years ago. And if you look at this star moving here, there's an inscription on my back wall. If I zoom to that back wall, you see this inscription which says, an unexamined life is not worth living by Socrates. That means we have to examine ourselves all the time. Now let us examine one of our beliefs. Example from a project management world. We all are familiar with the scope, schedule, budget, team, and deliverables and product quality. The common belief is that these all belong to domain of rationality. That means you can measure them, you can quantify them, and you can work on them. But look at the results. We have these books that you use, but look at the results from 2020 Chaos Report Standish Group for the IT projects in USA. 19% of the project failed, 31% of the projects only successful, and 50% are over budget, late, or reduced scope. And this is not only 2020 results. For the last 12 years, the same results are happening over and over again. What is the reason for these things? Obviously, he cannot blame China for that. So he will take responsibility. It's because our thinking that everything falls in the domain of rationality. Honestly, there is something called domain of irrationality. There are some fascinating books written by Dan Ariely that talks about irrationality in human beings. And if we cannot balance this domain of rationality with irrationality, you cannot run the project successfully. So let's examine another mistaken belief. Leaders are responsible for the job or the product. That's also wrong. Leaders are not responsible for the job. Managers are responsible for the job. Leaders are responsible for the people who are responsible for the job. That's why we end up with a three-legged tool where you could see the people leg is coming in because people are both rational and irrational. So let us continue and examine life philosophy. What are the difference between managers and leaders? Managers focus on things, leaders focus on people. Managers do things right, leaders do, do the right things. Managers plan, leaders inspire. Managers organize, leaders influence. Managers direct, leaders motivate. Managers control, leaders build. Managers follow rule, leaders shape entities. And you can see all of these things basically fall in the domain of irrationality. So what happens? We face a leader's paradox between emotion and irrationality. Our fixed mindset tells us if you're too emotional, you cannot be rational. Our growth mindset tells us if you are not emotional, you cannot be rational either. So how do we resolve this issue? We basically, I would go to poet Rumi, a Persian poet from 800 years ago, who said water is necessary for the boat to float. But if the water gets inside the boat, it sinks. So you need to have emotion to be able to be rational. But 
you cannot have too much emotion, then you will not be rational anymore. So essentially we need to look be emotionally intelligent and we need to have a combination of rational mind and emotional mind to create a wise mind. So what exactly is emotional intelligence? I've been talking about this. Emotional intelligence has five components. Self-awareness, knowledge of one's emotional values and recognize their impacts on others, self-regulation, social skill, empathy, which considers and respect other people's feelings and motivation, passion for the goal. These five components basically drives the emotional intelligence spectrum. You can remember them by saying this formula S cubed EM. So some of you may be fired up watching the movie clip. Let us look at what happened in that movie clip. The leader was self-aware. He self-regulated when he heard about the problem of the black woman not finding a bathroom in the building. He empathized with her situation and then he was motivated to solve the problem because his goal is to send an a American man into space. So he overcame with this, motivated by this goal, he was able to take action and get rid of you know, racially separated bathrooms. As I mentioned before, leaders are responsible for the people who are responsible for the job. Now, how important is emotional intelligence? May I, let me share with you some statistics. Career Builder survey of 2662 hiring managers in USA has found out that 59% would not hire someone who has high IQ, intelligent quotient, but low EI. 75% say they're more likely to promote the high emotional intelligent worker over high IQ worker. Some more statistics from the Harvard Business Review papers. 90% emotional intelligence accounts for nearly 90% of what sets high performers apart. So you can see the importance of emotional intelligence. 95% of us think that we are self-aware, but in reality, only 10 to 15% are actually self-aware. Empathy is the number one leadership skill. Those who master empathy perform 40% higher. And 72% employee respect, respectful treatment is the highest job satisfaction factor. So you can see how emotional intelligence becoming very critical in the leadership domain. So are you all fired up to be emotionally intelligent now, now that I gave you the, its importance? So I'm gonna take you to a journey to the peaks and valleys of leadership and emotional intelligence. The idea of this journey came from a famous Persian poet, Sufi poet, Fariduddin Attar. His book, The Conference of the Bard, or Mantik Tuayl. He basically talks about a story of a lot of bards getting together and starting a journey to find their leader, to their masters. And these bards, a lot of them start, but only few continue the journey and crosses the spiritual valleys, like valley of quest, valley of understanding, valley of love, valley of unity. So we're going to begin, begin similar journey, but we're going to go to the valleys and peaks of leadership and emotional intelligence. Let's see where we land on first. So let me begin a journey with the bards. <laughs> You can see only few are left in this leadership journey. No more so we end up in the valley of connection. And in this valley, first thing we meet is a cinema theater. So let's go watch a movie in this journey. I'm going to show you a movie clip from the movie Pocahontas from Disney which talks about how we are all connected to each other. Whether we are white or copper skin, we are all human beings and how we are all connected to each other. Connection is a key feature of leadership. So pay attention to the lyrics of the song, which is also shown in the subtitle. The rainstorm and the river are my brothers. The heron and the otter are my friends. And we are all connected to each other in a circle, in a hoop that never ends. How high does the sycamore grow? If you cut it down, then you'll never know. And you'll never hear the wolf cry to the blue corn moon. For whether we are white or copper skinned, we need to sing with all the voices of the mountain. 
with all the colors of the wind. So you can see emotional intelligence is like painting with the colors of the wind. We need to recognize the importance of connection. So let's look at some of the importance of connection and emotional intelligence. Today's world has a lot of problems like conflicts and war, social, national, and even personal life conflicts, environmental degradation and unhappiness. Conflicts and war happen because we lost our connection to our fellow men and women. Environmental degradation happens because we lost connection to planet Earth and other living things. And unhappiness happens because we lost connection to our soul. And you can see if you're emotionally intelligent, all these five aspects of emotional intelligence can help you rebuild the connection and solve many of the problems that we face today. So connection is very important for leadership. Many people communicate, but few connect. Connection is very important because without connections, you cannot lead. Here's a book by John Maxwell who talks about connecting is the ability to identify with the people and relate to them in a way that increases your influence with them. Connecting is never about me. And this paper and book by Amy Cuddy, a Harvard psychologist, she talks about the way to the influence and lead is to begin with the warmth. It is the conduit of influence. Connection builds the warmth, you know, in our human connections figure. I hear many people in our uh, you know, profession talk about that they're not getting the right level of admiration because they're highly competent people, but not getting the right level of you know, respect in their company or business. So maybe this two by two matrix, I'll be able to explain that high competence and high warmth. So if you are in this domain of high competence and high warmth, obviously you will get the admiration you need. But if you're a highly competent person, but have a low warmth, meaning poor connection, then people will be afraid of you and they'll envy you, but they may not admire you. And if you have a low competence and low warmth in this zone, you'll get the content, they'll hate you. But if you have a high warmth, but low competence, they'll pity you and maybe they'll cooperate with you. So this explains why we are not able to get the respect that we deserve or we want because we are not paying attention to the connection aspect of the leadership. Everyone has the capability to become a leader, but most of us are not. Why? This, here is my formula I created. Leadership is equal to leadership potential minus self-sabotage. Every day we sabotage our own potential to become good leaders. Here are four factors I've identified as the self-sabotaging factors. I call it EFDP, ego, fixed mindset, distrust, and profit loss obsession. So let us begin, let us continue our journey and see what we have with the barbs. So we arrive at the valley of ego, self-sabotage number one, the most poisonous three-letter word in the world is ego. You need to kill it. Ego drowns emotional intelligence, whatever you have left with, it kind of keeps drowning. And whatever motivation a little bit of you have, maybe it becomes a selfish motivation. Ego is the enemy of good leadership. Don't let praises get inside your head. Moment you think you're bigger than others, then you basically lose the edge on the leadership. Ego is the whisper in your ear that tells you that you are inherently better than others. Ego operates out of self-interest, seeks praise, ignores feedback, takes all credit, and tends to do everything himself or herself. So if you are doing any of these things, you are self-sabotaging and leadership potential. Ego is the root cause of most of the relationship problem we have with the family, with workplace, or in volunteer organization that you work. So here are my four tips to tame the ego. Practice saying sorry. Saying sorry does not mean that you are wrong. If you say sorry, even when you're right, it means that you care more about the relationship than about being right. Remove the word I from your emails and speech. Use we. At the end of each day, reflect on all the people who were part of your, I'm sorry, something has happened. I think somebody else is sharing the screen. 
now it's okay. You can share your screen again. Okay. Do you see my screen now? Right. Yeah, we can see. Yes, it's, it's back, yes. Okay, at the end of each day, reflect on all the people who were making you successful on that day because you are not successful by yourself and practice humility. Something is not working here. Yeah, practice humility every day because that is the best dose to kill the ego. Now, my everyday prayer to achieve humility, I'm gonna share with you a song from Nobel Laureate Robin Dinar Tagore with English translation. So practice of humility is very important for leadership. So let us continue our journey with the bar. We arrive at the value of fixed mindset. As I mentioned to you, this is self-sabotaging factor number two. Fixed mindset is limiting. It avoids challenges, gives up easily. It feels threatened by other success, desires to look smart. It thinks effort is fruitless. It ignores feedback and fixed abilities. This is a book written by Stanford professor Carol Dweck, Mindset, fascinating book. If you get an opportunity, read it. Growth mindset is freedom. It perseveres in the face of failures. Effort is required to build new skill. It believes and finds inspiration in other successes. It embraces challenge, accepts criticism, desire to learn, and it builds abilities. So fixed mindset, you need to move away from that. Otherwise, it'll be sabotaging your leadership potential. So we arrive at the valley of distrust, another self-sabotaging factor. The moment there is suspicion about a person's motive, everything he does becomes tainted. And then leaders are team builders. Teams are built on trust. There's a fascinating book by Stephen Covey called Speed of Trust. He also wrote another book called Smart Task, talks about trust tax, that lack of trust increases the cost of transaction. Teams with more trust produce more outputs. So let us continue our journey. So another, the fourth self-sabotage factor that we need to be careful about is the profit loss obsession. Purpose of a business is to make profit. That's a wrong notion. The true purpose of a business is to create and keep a customer, not to make you money. By Theodore Levitt, Harvard professor who wrote this fascinating book called Marketing Imagination, which actually influenced me a lot when I started my own business. And let me share with you another quote from American playwright, Arthur Miller. Don't be seduced in thinking that which do not make a profit is without value. So we have covered the fourth self-sabotage factor. Let us continue our journey with the book. We go to the peak of emotional intelligence. So here's another formula that I gave you a formula before for leadership equal to leadership potential minus self-sabotage, but your total leadership, TL equal to leadership times EI square. It looks like an Einstein formula of E equal to MC square, but essentially it shows you the power of emotional intelligence, how it can increase your total leadership score. Let me do some quick math, math calculation. Let us say you start with a leadership potential of 10. 
And for every self-sabotaging factor, you lose two points. So you end up with a point of two in your uh, thing. And then let us say that you start with an EI score potential of 10. And for every aspect of emotional intelligence you miss, you lose two points, you end up with zero. So what happens if you have an EI potential of 10 and leadership potential of 10, according to my formula of total leadership, you start with a score of thousand. But you can see as you move from left to right, your score goes to 200 because you're not controlling your self sabotaging factor. And then if you don't have any emotional intelligence, doesn't matter how much of leadership potential you have, the score is zero. So importance of emotional intelligence and leadership is critical. And then you start with low emotional intelligence and low leadership you know, score, you start with an eight, but you can see that you could move up as soon as you control your self sabotage factor and increase your emotional intelligence, you could move up to a target value of 1000. So the combination of these two factors are very important to improve your leadership skill. Stanford professor Jim Collins published two great books which also influenced me significantly when I was starting my company. He talked about five levels of leadership. Level one, level two, and level three, a lot of us are familiar with. Level three is the competent manager. But if you want to become an effective leader, you need to have vigorous pursuit of vision and high performance. And then in order to become an executive, you need to have an enduring greatness with a paradoxical blend of personal humility and professional will. These levels are very important for you to understand where you belong and where you want to be. So you want to be a leader. What do you need to do? Another uh, paper from Harvard Business School professor Michael Jansen talks about integrity, authenticity, and something bigger than yourself, three foundational elements of leadership. Remember my definition I gave you at the beginning, something bigger than yourself? This is very critical. How do you remember all these three foundational elements? Here is my way of remembering them. Remember, I am social. I for integrity, A for authenticity, and social for something bigger than oneself, because you have to create those kind of leadership ideas and notion in yourselves to become a leader. So let us continue our journey with the Bards again. So you can see in order to pick the leadership, you have to achieve all the picks. Without integrity, nothing works. Integrity is being whole, consistent, ethical, fair, and respectful, trustworthy, dependable, and principled. Integrity means cost-benefit analysis does not affect my world, that I will not change my world when I find out that I'm going to lose some money. Integrity is very critical for being a leader. Also, you need to be authentic. What in IT sector we call it YC week. What you see is what you get. Being honest, true to himself or herself, you cannot fake it. You need to be a leader. One cannot lead by acting like a leader. One can only be a leader by being a leader. That's critical. Then also the third component of the foundational elements of leadership is commit to something bigger than yourself. In volunteer organization, in work life and family, you need to commit to something bigger than yourself. You want to become a leader. Let me give you some examples of that. Professor Muhammad Yunus wanted to create a world without poverty. Do you think it's possible? Probably not. But his dream is bigger than himself and that he dedicated his entire life to create a world without poverty, but made some progress. Similarly, I have a dream of creating a world without religious terror, friendship of civilization. I believed in that. And I spent 10 years of my life writing this book called God's Faith Book where I've showed all the harmonious religions among all the religions, how it is harmonious. And then I lectured in temples, in churches, and in other places to promote this idea of that we need to build a friendship among all religions. Now, when I started my own company, I was driven by excellence. So I want to form an excellent company. So in my business card that I designed on the opposite side of my business card, I had this quote from Aristotle. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So that drive for excellence, which is much bigger than myself, helped me build a company which is still number one in our field in California, in the groundwater and water management model. So that drove me that kind of you know, commitment to excellence helped me. 
in your family life, equivalently, you need to think about what is bigger than yourself. Happiness of your spouse, happiness of your children, happiness of your family members. Something needs to be bigger than yourself. If you just think about yourself, you cannot build a happy family. So let us continue our journey with the birds again. <laughs> To become a leader, you need to develop a passion for learning. Here are my personal influencers that have helped me to learn. Like I learned in a very early age about Socrates, know thyself, Maxim, and I have tried to use it in all my life activity. Then another word that influenced me significantly is Ikra. This is the first word that was given by Jabril to Prophet Muhammad You know, this is the first word that came from the God to him, Ikra, meaning read. And I was introduced to Quran in fifth grade or so. And I have been reading since then. Lots of other books, lots of various books I've been reading. And reading helps you to build your leadership skill. Another prayer that has influenced me in my life significantly, that a prayer that my father taught me, it's, it's a Quranic prayer called Rabbi Zidni Ilma, O oh Lord, increase me in knowledge. So I have tried every day, I try to increase my knowledge in some form or the other. That's kind of my driving force, that everything I do is my knowledge getting increased. You know, that's what I, I need to do that. So develop a passion for learning. John F. Kennedy died on November 22, 1963, but he prepared a speech that he was not able to deliver because somebody killed him. Leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. So what I would recommend you is to form a deep pact with yourself. Here are my eight rules of leadership. That you need to, you need to become a leader, you need to have a deep pact with you. So D for dream more than others think is realistic. You need to dream because your dream cannot be realistic. Dream needs to be bigger. You know, only big dream, dreams can be bigger than yourself. Then in this deep pact, E is endure hardship with more resolve than others think is tenable. Ensure everyone is having more fun than others think is imaginable. You need to have fun in your work because laughter is the best medicine. Do something that brings enjoy every day at work and at home. Protect yourself from self-sabotage more than others think is necessary because self-sabotage is what takes away from us our leadership potential, ego, fixed mindset, distrust, and profit loss motives that basically takes all the leadership potential away. So you need to protect yourself from self-sabotage more than others think is necessary. Practice more humility than others think is possible. Remember the level five leaders quality? Humility is one of the biggest virtue of level five leaders. Act with more integrity than others think is rational. You need to have integrity. You know, you just cannot be kind of changing your world as, you know, opportunity or profit loss motives drives you. Care for people more than others think is reasonable. Remember I mentioned to you, the job of a leadership is not to do the job, but to take care of the people who performs the job. So you need to take care of the people more than others think is reasonable. Trust more than others think is safe. Remember the trust text I talked to you about? It will increase the transaction cost in many ways, time, money, and potential. Therefore, you need to trust more than others think is safe. Otherwise, this distrust self-sabotage factor will take away from the leadership potential. Hang this slide from a wall and examine your actions in light of this deep pact with yourself. You need to tell yourself that I'm gonna follow these rules in my life and examine yourself every day. As Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living. One thing you may have noted in this sentence I have, I have underlined the word others. Why do you think I'm talking about the others so much in every single sentence? There are two fascinating books written by Jonah Berger, a Horton business school professor on invisible influence and contagion that talks about how others influence us. 
These books are actually written for marketing purposes, but they help you understand how we are influenced by others, how we make decisions that are influenced by others. And there's another great book by Wayne Dyer. If you want to escape from the trap of negative thinking, read this book, Your Erroneous Zone because negative thinkers will influence you and promote you to the self-sabotage and reduction of emotion and intelligence. So you need to be cautious about those things. As I mentioned to you, you have the potential. You need to continue to develop the skill. Now, everyone has the capability to become a leader. You got a dream, you got to protect it. So I'm going to share with you another one and a half minute clip from a movie named Pursuit of Happiness. 2006 up by now, right? Arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. Swami Vivekananda, you have the leadership potential in yourself. You need to protect yourself from the self separating factor, cultivate emotional intelligence, but continue to work on these things. So I started with the promise today that I will set you all on fire. I don't know whether I was able to meet that promise through my lecture, but it's a continuous process of exploration of leadership, getting new ideas and protecting yourself from self-sabotage and cultivating an emotional intelligence. So this exploration will never end, like from the words of the poet T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration. At the end of all our exploring, will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. With that, I want to end my presentation. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you. Sakib, you have fired, you have fired us. And thank you for a truly enlightening and heartwarming presentation. So uh, with that, uh, I'll open up uh, for questions. And uh, if you can raise your hand, then uh, I, I hope uh, uh, Najmul can, uh, or, you know, if you raise your hand and if you want to, you know, ask a question to the panel, then uh, you can unmute yourself and ask that question. Otherwise, Kayom, I'll be starting on some of the questions. Kayom, I have a question. Yes, yes please. Uh, yeah. Amra, huh? সবাই জানে যে ফ্রেঞ্চের এক কার্টুন একটা কার্টুন আকার ফলে কি হলো সারা ওয়ার্ল্ড এবং ফ্রেঞ্চে তা এই ধরনের ঘটনা সোসাইটিতে কোনোভাবেই ভালো কিছু আনে না এটা পরীক্ষিত বারবার এই জিনিসগুলো হচ্ছে এবং বারবার সোসাইটিড বাই কাইম বাট আই ক্যান ডু ইট ইন ইংলিশ আই এম আই এম টেলিং অ্যাবাউট দি ইনসিডেন্ট cartoonist in French, what he did and what was the after effects. Such activities have been proven that this cannot bring any peace and harmony in the society. In the end, these do not give any fruitful result. They, it is targeting a particular sect of a society, so, but everybody support it. Many people support it from the concept of freedom of his voice. But truly, there is no freedom of speech. You cannot tell anything with this. Now, in this context, my question is, is there anything like emotional intelligence, collective emotional intelligence, that it should work when most people will stand against it? No, you cannot do it. So is there any concept like that collective emotional intelligence. Please, uh, Dr. Rehnu Makarim and then Sakib. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, oh, thank you so much, uh, Sakib Bhai, for the wonderful presentation. Um, and I really enjoyed the videos. Uh, one of the thing I have seen that when we are talking about leadership, I will focus uh, my uh, focus my conversation on leadership, that we have to choose whether we want to uh, work above the line or below the line. So there is like, where do you stand below the line? 
when we are talking about below the line, it is usually defensive, close-minded. Uh, we seek approval. We are blaming others. Uh, we are we are we feel that we have we are committed to what we are talking about. We are the one who are always right. Uh, the, there are people who will think that they are right and they will reflect in that way uh, and they won't account for other people's emotion. And that shows that uh, those person have lack of leadership because they cannot understand the emotional bank account of other collective people. So that is when you are operate, operating below the line. And we are striving to look uh, for going above the line in leadership with emotional intelligence. And that is, we have to be open, we have to be curious, and we have to be committed to learning. And we have to respect others. When you are in that leadership, then you know that your emotional bank account is going up. And in this case, uh, what Nazmul uh, Bhai was talking about, uh, definitely we could see like in both ways, there were some issues. Uh, one is like, why do we need to react to naysayers? Whatever they say does not impact us unless or until we react. And then most of the people collectively will know what is truth and what is wrong. I think if we have those kind of understanding, then these kind of conflict can go down. And that kind of leadership, we are, Nelson Mandela was that kind of leadership. He embraced, he did not antagonize people and he reacted with a sense of peace. And I think when you are into that collective mode of connecting with everybody, you were talking about connection. I think connection is about understanding each other and not jumping into conclusion all the time. And those things can lead us to that higher level of conscious leadership. So I think the world we are in, we are not conscious about uh, how we react. We are not conscious about how we talk. Once we collectively think about that, that is when we are going to reach in that emotional, uh, emotional collectivity. Thank you, Renoma. Now, Sikhir, do you want to go address this question? Sure. I think, uh, as I said, uh, it's uh, a lot of it is because of lack of knowledge. Remember, I mentioned to you, a lifelong learning is important. So a lot of disinformation, you know, is exists in this world. If you talk about this religious extremism, you know, obviously I wrote a book on the harmony of religions that I tried to show that through knowledge and through interaction of interfaith dialogues, we can overcome some of these kind of things. But at the same time, it's all about warmth. Because if we think about Samuel Huntington's philosophy of the clash of civilizations, we are talking about not creating warmth between different civilizations. We try to confront each other at a level. So what happens if we don't have the warmth in you, then nobody will trust you. That kind of warmth can only come from interfaith dialogues a lot of activity in this regard, and also disseminating the correct information about various religions. That's what I think. Thank you, Sakib. Manjur, any additional thoughts? Before I, uh, I go to the answer of the question, uh, I want to have a uh, sort of a comment about the whole idea of uh, leadership and emotional intelligence the way I see it. Uh, definitely, Sakib has covered many, many angles of these uh, two things, which are interrelated to each other uh, to make one effective in the workplace. But my experience about the whole thing is based on my uh, at least two decades of uh, soul searching that why I'm not a good leader and how do I make myself a uh, good leader, communicator, or whatever you call it, influencer at the workplace. So I, I noticed, three different thing which, which I want to share with you, that the workplace is drastically changing over the years. When I say drastically changing, at, it used to be a command and control uh, type of workplace. A leader is sitting on top and he's telling something, everybody's following, no question, no answer, you know? I said, so you do it, you know? But as of, as, as of today, most of the workplace especially we people who are working. Uh, our workplaces are uh, what we call knowledge workers workspace, where every individual knowledge worker need to be a leader. It's not the uh, program manager or the director who will tell us and will just deliver whatever 
that guy tells us. We'll have to take leadership. We'll have to build uh, teams, make relationships so that we can deliver. And then in the knowledge workspace, you cannot do anything alone anymore. You will have to cooperate with lots of other people. Although you are an expert in a particular case area, but that area cannot, cannot alone deliver a service or a product. You'll have to co cooperate with other people. That's one, one very important thing. And then in this horizontal collaboration, I'm talking about trust, which Sakib uh, uh, touched, that trust is very important. And to build the trust, you'll have to be emotionally intelligent. Now, over the years, different philosophers try to uh, understand what makes people uh, that good leader, that happy leader. One other dimension is happy. We want to lead at the same time, we want to be happy ourselves as well as as a group. So how do we do that? We build a trust between the people we, we uh, are leading and then I myself want to be happy at the end of the day about my outcome uh, from the whole team or leading the whole team. So uh, Barton Russell has written the Conquest of Happiness book, very famous book in 1930. And after that, Dale Carnegie wrote another book, How to Win Friends and uh, Influence People. You know? But as of today, our knowledge base has grown extensively in the area of how evaluation has made our brain to work in a certain way. And we know about individuals brain structure, how things are being accepted and uh, reacted upon uh, by the autonomous brain and the rational brain. And based on all these things, we are telling people that, hey, you need to know yourself first. And then you need to know your emotion. You'll have to manage your emotion as well as you need to know the other party you are dealing with, their emotions and then build relationship. Thank that you, Manjur. We have to move on a little bit. I see two raised hands. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nassim, could you please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question to the panelists? Thank you so much, Mr. Khan. Um, I was uh, listening to the presentation of Dr. Najmus Saqib. It was an excellent presentation. So thank you so much. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it and it was very, very informative. I personally has been benefited from a lot of knowledge today, for sure. What I want to raise here is, as we know that uh, uh, Dr. Sakib already mentioned about the trust and integrity and how important the trust is. And I, what I believe is a captain of a team is only as good as the team. So the trust is very important and the correlation between trust and productivity is there for sure. Now the trust coming from the connectivity. And as you know, in this world, the workplace is changing uh, rapidly. Uh, just now, Mr. Chaudhary just mentioned, and the, it, it is, it's an evolving workplace. So the nature of workplace changing, the nature of work itself is changing, and more and more employers are leaning towards contracting, outsourcing, stuff like that. So people are working from, I know in the private sectors, people have been working remotely for the last several years. But in public sector, now that the pandemic, one good side of the pandemic is now that the public sector where I work, I work for the federal government of Canada. And the government is now moving towards working remotely. So combining both these, while the workplace and the flexible workplace and the work arrangement is changing, how do you see from your experience, um, Dr. Sakib, that as a leader or as, a, um, as the captain of the team, when you do not see your employees on the floor every day, as Mr. Chaudhary just mentioned, before it was, okay, here is my boss, here is the director or president, and every day we are having meetings. Now that we are doing meetings over Zoom and MS team and whatnot, but do you think it, it puts a bigger challenge for the leaders to, to flourish them? Or rather you, you would think that this will further pave the way for potential leaders to express themselves. Which way you think this changing workplace and changing nature of work um, will have the impact on the leaders or potential leaders? So, Saki, before you answer, I would request the panelists to uh, sort of provide short answers so that we can have a few more questions answered. Thank you. Sorry, my question was rather too big. Go ahead, Saki. Thank you. It's a good question. I think we need to, we cannot control the changing workplace. 
So we have to adjust ourselves, you know. And the workplace, the way it is changing, you know, in the speed of trust, the book that I mentioned about from Stephen Covey, basically, if you trust somebody, they will perform to the level of your trust. If you don't trust somebody, they will not perform well. So this kind of a kind of what you call hyperloop that you create by trusting anybody. But obviously there is certain risks because government is not used to be trusting that much, but the world has changed. I don't think we can, we have to find ways to creatively monitor or measure progress, our metric that we used to do. Like if you show up at eight o'clock and leave at five o'clock, we used to think you have done a productive day, but that metric needs to be changed. So what's happening with this change in the pandemic world, actually there are a couple of papers in Harvard Business Review recently that talks about in this changing world, how do you have to change your metric? How do you have to change your connection platform? Like how do you address people's need for connecting to each other remotely? And that whole dynamic is changing, a lot of psychology and some of the tools are coming into picture. So this is a changing workplace. I don't think I have an answer, but I believe we'll find ways to trust and be productive. Our measures will be now different. Thank you, Sakib. Manjur, you want to add something? Yeah, uh, I, I want to share uh, my experience over this last sure. year, how you maintain that uh, relationship with our, our group and, and what, what I personally do. Uh, to, in our workplace, we do work. At the same time, we need to tell what we, we have done so that it gets focused at different level so that people know that what you are delivering, you know? So if I'm, I'm not uh, telling my, my guys what I'm doing or what I'm working on, then uh, uh, the trust building part, I think will not work. So what I do at the end of every week, I, I make a, a bullet points that last week, what I have done and send it to my manager, who is, who is the one who, who need to know that. And then uh, I depend on her to disseminate that down the, uh, to the other members as necessary, you know? So I keep myself open. I think for the leader itself, also to ask the good questions uh, every now and then through whatever mechanism they have to, to understand what is the deliverable. And then uh, also to express that, hey, I have full faith on you. You are a professional. I know you know your work, go ahead and do it. As long as you can deliver, I have nothing to say. So come to me, I have an open space or open phone, you know, for me to, you Thank know. you, Manjur. Uh, Dr. Renoma, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, uh, because I live six months uh, in Bangladesh and six months in USA, I have to work remotely. I have been working remotely for a long time. And for the last year, it has been a little bit challenged, not that much, uh, because I already have a system of working. So when we are all meeting in Zoom, uh, with my team in Bangladesh, uh, the first thing we do is, okay, let's, uh, how was your day? What's going on? So I always try to find the human, uh, uh, human aspect first, not work first, but human aspect first. And from there, we start to ask questions, like what are the th things that we need to address? So emotion, then asking good question, uh, these all have to be uh, aggregated together. And not only that, because we are talking about emotional intelligence and leadership, sometimes you also need to, not sometime, always you need to observe each other's face. Even in Zoom, you can see who is engaged, who is not engaged, who is down. So I don't talk about it in the meeting because that's not emotionally intelligent behavior. Uh, after the meeting, I uh, send that person a message like, so is everything going on okay with your life? Uh, what is working? What is not working? Because sometimes our expectation, we cannot just put our expectation on others, but there are things that are going in people's life that we need to observe as leaders and then we have to reach out. And when I am a, a working in that way, I think that is why my team who are not getting paid since 2017, they are giving the hundred percent because they feel that they belong to this club. And it's not just the leader who is ordering, but a leader who is caring. So Thank I you. think those things matter. Thank you very much. So this will be our last question from Ms. Sylvia. Please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I take with me deep packed for myself, as well as uh, to say thank you for like this presentation was packed with so many tips and so many uh, knowledgeable, you know, references that I will take, you know, with me. And I think I will refer back in my, you know, continued journey. 
Uh, my question is uh, on the current environment in, uh, in the world right now, you know, with I Can't Breathe, racism, diversity and inclusion. Uh, these are very important uh, right now in the Western world. Um, I live in Canada, so, you know, we've been preached that, we've been told that this is very important. It should have been always important. But right now it's in the spotlight. Uh, my question to uh, all of you is, you know, what... I mean, in, we are on the receiving end, being you know, brown, being of color. How do we um, try to bring uh, people uh, you know, and see us as leaders, see us with uh, you know, having the emotional intelligence to carry on for, with, with around those who do not have that kind of open mind, uh, you know, who are racist uh, or who do not have, see us in that light that we can be leaders. So my question to you is, uh, is there tips, is there leadership skills? How, what, what do we do to move ourselves forward and above them? We know we are leaders, but to make others believe that we can be leaders going forward. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'll start with Manjur, but we are uh, running out of time. So I would really request uh, to uh, keep your response at one minute each. Thank you. Okay, let me know when the one minute is over. My God. <laughs> so, okay, uh, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll try to uh, answer that yeah, question. Of Sylvia, Sylvia uh, I manage the diversity and inclusion uh, program of my group for the last 20 years. And right now I'm in a uh, diversity uh, steering committee to set up corporate level diversity initiative. So to answer your question directly is that we'll have to have build up the relationship with the people to whom we want to give that understanding that I have something to offer as a leader, you know? So first of all, I try to build the personal rebel relationship before I go into the professional rebel relationship. I ask that individual, hey, how things going or about his family, about his hobby. And then I need to deliver, if I want to be a leader, the, the whatever the, outcome they are expecting from a leader consistently. Rather, I need to be a role model to establish myself, you know? So the relationship and then establishing their, uh, myself by doing, delivering continuously is the only way to do. Thank you, Manjur. Now, uh, Dr. Ehnuma, anything to add? Uh, yeah, first, uh, I, I never see myself as somebody who is brown skinned or woman or something like that. I always see myself first as a human. And when I go into the meeting or any places, I like I do project that uh, that energy that I'm not a brown skinned woman, but there are people who will judge you for your skin. And in that way, you have to show, and as uh, Mr. Manzoor uh, said, uh, that you have to build a connection. So talk to the people, uh, show them who you are as a person, what are your interests. You're not just that brown skinned woman, but you have a lot to offer. When you show that at the table, I was a full-time faculty at SUNY Brockport, and then I left because my supervisor had that racist attitude, and I started, but later on, the people realize that what they're missing, they missed one of my, my component and they invited me back. And now I'm an adjunct faculty again, teaching it uh, SUNY. So you have to show them instead of being judgmental or showing the stereotypes or even playing with the stereotypes, you show who you are and what you uh, offer in the table and build a connection. I think that can help a lot. Thank you, Dr. Renuma. Sakib, so last words. Well, there's a tough question. Diversity and inclusion is a double-edged sword. If those who are in the minority group, they think they're entitled to certain position, that's a problem. At the same time, if it comes as a dole, also the problem. To me, diversity and inclusion, the way I look at it, it basically is a business driver. Diversity and inclusion needs to bring in some business profit in both ways, in the government, some performance results and in the industry, some of the business, you know, it has to be a business driver. And the other thing is very important is the equity. It's not only inclusion or diversity, just having a member from this color or that color, it's the equity that's more important that's than diversity and inclusion. Absolutely. And then what you need to do, if you are trying to, you're facing these problems, you know, first of all, I would say, don't complain, number one. 
tips. Number two, set yourself on fire. Learn leadership skills and show your leadership through other means in the, in the office or in other places. There are many avenues you can do build leadership skill. And that if you build your leadership potential, someday people will realize that they have to utilize because you need to bring something. I think entitlement is the wrong approach. You have to think about what do I bring to the table that would not be there if I'm not there. Thank you, Sakib. Uh, although we Thank are you. out of time, I still yeah, have two other. Uh, Hassan, can you unmute yourself? And he has a question for uh, Sakib. Yes, uh, Sakib. Yes. My question is, I have a guts feeling like that Politicians are most emotionally intelligent and then psychologists. So what do you say among the professions? Uh, how do you rank it? Just a rough, your guess. That's, really. a, that's a political question. Remember, at the beginning, you guys said the rules. No political question could be discussed. <laughs> no, politicians so, does not mean political question. It is my gut feeling that they are emotionally intelligent. But what do you think that engineers are more than others or psychologists or doctors, just a gut feeling. I don't think, I think it's a matter of exposure because what happens, we are not aware. Most of us are victims of self-sabotage and most of us are not aware or consciously choosing to be emotionally intelligent. Of course, we have some, every aspect, every profession has some, but sometimes we do not use it at the right time. So it is, it is a learning process. We need to learn how to do that. I don't think it is a monopoly of any particular profession. Being clever is not emotionally intelligent, which politicians may be, but that's not emotional intelligence. That's a good, good answer. Thank you, Sakib. Thank you, Sakib. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Renuma, Manjur, and Sakib uh, for the excellent discussion and also the audience for their time and interest. And Najmul, uh, I'd like to hand over to you now for uh, any concluding yeah. remarks you have. Thank you. Thank you, all presenters. Actually, I'm Rafa from Banglai, I'm the cultural understanding. It is for the Bangladeshi people, but others 